first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be the guest of your country uh, in regard to this program, media and uh, mm -hmm. governmental program. It was quite informative for me and, of Good. course, you know, I was able to see how the things work in Germany uh, related to politics and to journalists. There is one event which was discussed uh, within the framework of, framework of our long-standing relationships, you know, contacts between the two countries. The German wagons uh, delivered to Bulgarian railway, railway company this summer, they, you know, they create kind of uh, euphoria in uh, Bulgarian uh, media and Bulgarian society. Are you surprised by this? Uh, not really, because uh, um, I had the honor to accompany your Minister of Transport yeah. uh, for the inauguration. Uh, of those uh, of the first delivery of those wagons at uh, Sofia Central Station, and I had the same feeling. I was really very very happy, and I'm so much looking forward to travel Bulgaria uh, by train. And uh, of course, there's probably still a lot to do, but I'm a, an avid train traveler myself. In Germany, I use only the train to get from A to B. Uh, and uh, no, I was happy and also entering these wagons, it made me feel so much at home because I know them from, from Germany. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is also one uh, supporting question, so yes. to say, the German company Stadler, which won uh, two procurement procedures to purchase uh, 42 uh, wagons for Bulgarian railway company, they gave up the contract. I emphasize on German because there is a key point, a key word in our news. So this case uh, had a significant response in Bulgarian media, even in Bulgarian yeah. parliament. What's your comment on that? Well, actually, I cannot comment on that because uh, Stadler is not a German company. As far as I know, it is Polish. Um, I do not know the concrete historical reasons uh, uh, for... Uh, uh, I don't know the history of the company, and Stadler indeed sounds very German. Sounds but German, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have no information on this whatsoever because it's not a German company. Sorry. It's a point that has to be cleared in, uh, it's a remark from yeah. my side, not a question. It, it's a point that has to be cleared in Bulgarian media because even today while driving to the German embassy, congratulations for the new facilities. Thank um, you. As far as I know, I'm the first journalist to enter with the camera equipment. Uh, you building, are. So thank you, you for are. this invitation too. Uh, and on the Bulgarian national radio, I was listening to the news reports oh. and they were discussing the German wagons. So you made okay. it clear that this is okay, a Polish no, it's, company. I'm, I'm, it, it is not a German company and I really cannot comment on that. Sorry. Mm. Uh, topic of trains brings up the topic yeah. of uh, climate change. Your minister uh, was a co-chairman of the Green Party in Germany. Yes. Um, at the Federal Ministry of Foreign Affairs, climate diplomacy has been developed ever since. It, it's still in you know development. So considering that, uh, what's your take on the last generation movement, which blocked Frankfurt Airport a few days ago, recently, not a few days ago, and disturbed the uh, travel across Europe? Hmm. I think it's very, very frustrating. If you want to travel somewhere and then you don't take off and all your plans are disturbed uh, because of such uh, manifestation, uh, I think uh, civil disobedience is always a difficult subject. Um, but uh, people who engage in those kind of actions are fully well aware that they will be brought before justice criminal justice, but also civil justice, they will probably be uh, sentenced to pay damages, etc., etc. Um, so I think it is, it is a difficult subject, but it also uh, shows that there are people who feel very, very strongly that humanity should do something about climate change and about reducing our consumption of fossil energies and since we were talking about trains right now I think using the train as a, and building up your railway network is a very very good move in that direction and me personally that is where I put my accents uh, to help with this green transition as it is called uh, and that is as you 
said something which is not only very important for my minister, Ms. Baerbock, uh, but for the whole German government. I think uh, concerning this, you will not find any divisions. We want to stick to the climate goals of the European Union. And we are on a good way, I think, <clears throat> because, of course, things are difficult. Uh, but, for example, last year Germany had uh, uh, raised its percentage of uh, green electricity um, to 50% of our electricity. Uh, and the system is stable. And not only have our electricity prices decreased, uh, because, I mean, renewable energies are cheaper. Once you have them, they are cheaper. Uh, you need, of course, adaptations in the distribution network. Uh, but that seems to have gone very well because our number of blackouts or black and brownouts were the lowest in the whole of the European Union last year. So I think it's a good story. Mm -hmm. Okay, but speaking of renewable uh, sources of energy, the Germany is known about uh, its effort to get rid of the uh, nuclear power, but the war in Ukraine, Russian war in Ukraine, I think it's changed, you know, the overall landscape of Europe, your European energy supplies. So it's a difficult political question about uh, German nuclear program, etc. How is Germany doing in that regard concerning the war and, <coughs> you know, the issues with the power supply from Russian sources? Hmm. Let me maybe uh, uh, speak about nuclear energy first, uh, because it is one energy source in a mix of many possible uh, sources of energy. Uh, and Germany has decided to uh, get out of nuclear energy, uh, and uh, Germany will stick by that decision. Um, it's been an issue that has been discussed in German society for many, many years. And I think uh, two factors have been really decisive. Uh, and one factor is uh, that nobody knows what to do about nuclear waste. It yeah. keeps piling up. But as 50 years ago, we are being told, yeah, a solution will be found soon. But the last 50 years, no solution has been found, uh, as far as I'm aware of. Uh, and I think uh, that is one of the reasons um, why the German population decided we should not producing, be, go on producing more really dangerous waste and nobody, it, it just piles up and nobody yeah, knows no what to do about to it. it. And the second thing is that contrary to what many people think, it is an incredibly expensive form of energy. It is the most expensive. It is true that it is climate neutral, that speaks in its favor, but so are other forms. And any form of renewables costs a fraction of what nuclear energy costs. Mm -hmm. uh, nuclear energy is security intensive. And since you were talking about the effects of the Russian aggression, yeah. um, where does nuclear fuel come from? Will that really make us independent in Europe? As far as I'm aware, nuclear fuel does not come from Europe. Yeah. So all these questions of dependency and where does the stuff come from uh, and to whom do we enter in relations procuring nuclear fuel still remain. <clears throat> I think uh, every country needs to find their own answer to that. Uh, but uh, maybe one last remark on nuclear energy. <clears throat> there is not one insurer in the whole world who will insure a nuclear power plant. Yeah, it's a serious issue. And I think that is also an argument. <laughs> anyway, German society has answered that question, and we are not going back on that. And it's for a answer, no point of view. No. Okay, thank you. The so-called uh, Green Deal uh, has proven to be quite painful for many Europeans. It's an you know, ongoing uh, d debate even yeah. nowadays. Uh, despite of uh, tangible and quite, you know, we feel it quite well, even quite, quite strongly, even here in Bulgaria, you know, the climate changes. Yeah. Uh, after the Euro votes uh, recently, the German conservatives, uh, they seem to be the persons who insist on uh, dropping the uh, restriction of uh, production uh, of the cars with the uh, internal combustion. Yeah, 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 with the combustion uh, yeah, engine. Combustion engines, mm -hmm. yes, precisely. Yeah. Thank you for the correction. So, uh, how far has this discussion gone in Germany? 
uh, the European country that is arguably the largest car manufacturer, even not only in Europe, probably in the world as well. Hmm. Among the, you know, largest car. Yeah, I, I think we are we are talking about a transformation, mm -hmm. a real profound transformation, not only in the car sector, but in nearly all sectors of industrial production. Uh, and you're right, car production is a pillar of German economy. Uh, Everybody knows, and, you know. <laughs> and I think uh, that uh, um, maybe transformation here has taken quite a long time to, to be recognized as a serious task. Uh, and you know, I mean, everybody is conservative. We change our personal habits not because uh, we know we should change them, because at the point where we have to. Yeah? How many times have we told ourselves, oh, I should do more sports, oh, I should give up smoking, oh, I should do this and that. But we actually do it when we come up against a situation where we have to. I think that's human. Uh, and uh, German car industry, I think, has understood that the situation is here. And I'm very, very confident uh, in not only in German engineering uh, to master this from the technological side, uh, but also in the power to transform of German economy. Uh, we have proven it with other issues. I think we are going to do it here. Now, transformation times are not times of growth. I have to say that too. Uh, and many people have been worried about the performance of German economy. And if you allow me a little bit of a longer answer, I'm or uh, uh, <laughs> um, you know, in the last four and a half years, a lot of stuff has happened. There has been COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, that has been really hard also on the economy, but also on state finances. We came through that all right in Germany. Uh, but also due to really a lot of resources being pumped, pumped into structures so that they do not crumble. Uh, we are currently being host to 1.2 million Ukrainian refugees. Mm -hmm. Now that is not something that is much talked about, nor should it, because we do it very gladly and very happily. Um, but it is a task which needs to be tackled. 1.2 million people to be integrated in the school system, in the public system, etc. They need to have housing, etc. It's, it's a task. And then came the Russian attack on Ukraine and uh, with its con consequences on the energy market and all of a sudden, of course, energy prices rocketed sky high. Uh, it did help the transformation to the renewable energies. It, it really gave it a boost. But these capacities still have to be built up. So that is the overall framework of the German economic situation. So we are in the middle of a transformation, and I think we are managing very well. And we have not slipped into a recession, but last quarter even managed to have a 1.2% percentage growth, which is not satisfying. I, I give you that. But um, I think uh, um, given these overall all circumstances and this big transformation while remaining an industrial manufacturing place, I think we did quite well. Okay, I hope so and congratulations for that. Um, you have spent uh, year and a half already in Bulgaria, mm. in our country. How difficult is it is for you to navigate through our very, you know, maybe it's not that unique, but let me, you know, put some national pride in the question, our unique political puzzle. Is it, <laughs> you know, I sympathize with the journalists and uh, diplomats yeah. from other countries, which has to, you know, yeah. report to their, you know, headquarters or their media. Uh, report the situation in Bulgaria. Is it, you know, is it easy to navigate through this, I would say again, unique Bulgarian political puzzle? Um, okay. Ne <laughs> uh, no? So, uh, it is a challenge, yes. And it is very dynamic, to use a nice word. 
Um, and actually, we are now celebrating our third national holiday, which is on the 3rd of October, um, right next to elections. And very practically, I'm just worried that many of the guests that we would like to receive to celebrate our national holiday from the Bulgarian political landscape will probably be very, very busy still with the electoral campaign and not be able to turn up at our national holiday. Okay, that's probably not what you had in mind. Uh, it's just one of the... Uh, I think it's very complex. Uh, and um, I, what most worries me, what most worries me uh, in the Bulgarian political dialogue uh, is that compromise has such a bad name. Um, compromise. compromise between parties. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the realization that we all of us, we live in societies where most of our co-citizens are not of the exactly quite same opinion. Life realities are very different. They are very different in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is a country that 35 years ago lived in a totally different system. And these things take time. We see it in uh, uh, East Germany. It takes time. There's a lot of careers that have taken an unplanned turn. There's difficult life histories and there's all of that. But I think what really worries me is or, or what, what I think uh, would be a very, very good thing for the Bulgarian political discussion is to find a way to compromise. To compromise on political goals, to say, okay, I maybe, I, fictitiously, I had 30% at the elections. I cannot expect that I will reach 100% of my political mm -hmm. goals. Um, let us find a compromise where we maybe can realize our most important goals, but maybe not be satisfied 100%, and vice versa. So this culture of coalitions and of compromise, uh, I think there's, uh, that is something that Bulgaria would profit if such a culture could grow. It doesn't mean that you like each other, it doesn't mean that you agree with each other, but it agrees that you're able to live with each other, realizing that it's a picture of society. Mm -hmm. uh, I myself quite often give example of uh, German so-called negotiation technology. Uh, for the last few, probably two decades, you know, Germany is famous with its negotiation process and how the different parties, even now, you mm -hmm. know, the now uh, the, the nowadays, you know, ruling coalition also is a complex, you know, combination of different parties. Oh, yes. different, so. Maybe you could share a few more insights on, uh, you know, or your personal opinion, how this negotiation go process goes between the parties, behind the closed doors, and then in front of the media. At the end of every, you know, negotiation day, what happens and how this negotiation goes on, actually. So I have to say, uh, I'm not an insider. I never participated in this kind of negotiations because I'm not a party politician. Mm -hmm. I'm a career diplomat and yeah. uh, but still, uh, yeah, before you know. joining the foreign affairs, I was a, a lawyer. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yes, of course, there, there are some general things, some general observations which I can sure. share. Uh, and I think very important it is to have a, a first contact where you have a small team uh, which kind of sounds out whether there is a possibility at all to reach a compromise. Mm -hmm. um, also, we have had a uh, good experience with what we call a coalition treaty. That is, when the negotiating teams of the two, or in our case now the three sides, have um, agreed on the big lines. You get the specialists who work out the details, because as you know, the devil is in the detail, not too much details. Because uh, um, I think politics is dynamic and sometimes external things happen, as we know. Uh, so you also need some flexibility. So be specific as what you want to reach. Uh, shed a light on the complicated areas you want to attack and have some confidence 
and the people who will drive the process. Because if you are dissatisfied, four years later there will be an election. <laughs> yes. Okay. Four so years later, I stress, not six months later. Four years, yeah, precisely. One <laughs> Give full them a term. chance. One full term, yeah. P people need some time to... Not everything works. If you want to turn the housing sector around, six months are not enough. Mm -hmm. Or the judicial system in our or case. Or the judicial system, yes. Okay, uh, the situation is challenging not only in Bulgaria, probably to some extent in Germany also, but it's challenging in uh, the whole European Union. Uh, political movements uh, which were, I would say, unthinkable just a few months or years mm. ago, they, they are quite visible nowadays in European Parliament, in European politics, the so-called Eurosceptics. Uh, they are gaining uh, popularity. Uh, as far as I know, there are some elected mayors in the eastern part of uh, Germany, in so-called East Germany, uh, which uh, resigned from their posts because they have been attacked by the far right, so to say. Mm -hmm. So um, regional elec elections are coming up this year in some federal states in the former GDR, the German Democratic Republic before the uh, reunion. Uh, my question is, what do you think, why the wall in the people's heads hadn't been uh, dismantled, hadn't been overcome yet 35 years later. This question is quite relevant also in our Bulgarian context. Uh, and this year, as far as I know, remember, we will celebrate the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, 35 years of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm. So why is it still there in the head of, heads of some European citizens? Okay. Well, that is a very complex question, and I would sure. not pretend to have the answer. Full answer. Yeah. No, uh, but maybe just some some thoughts. Uh, I think. Um, well, I was born in West Germany, mm -hmm. um, so my impression from being in East Germany, I have family in East Germany. My daughter goes to university in East Germany, so there's, it's part of Germany. I don't even like the expression East Germany, yeah? It is yeah, specific places. The there's Dresden, political... there's Leipzig, there's yeah. Greifswald, there's Rostock, there's, like, it's Frankfurt and Düsseldorf and Munich. Anyway, no, no, I, I fully understand. Mm -hmm. I did not want to uh, correct this. I just, me personally, I've started not to use it anymore. Uh, because, uh, as you said, 35 years after the events, maybe we should think differently. Um, but uh, one, observation, one observation is, um, because you mentioned that the wall and the heads, um, I'm, I'm looking for the reason somewhere else. Uh, I think uh, those socialist systems, yeah, um, I mean, on the surface of it, they were big on participation. But in the reality of it, uh, citizens could not participate in it. They could not shape politics. They could go along with the politics that were designed from above, but they could not shape what was going on in the government, um, broadly speaking. Uh, and I think this has led to an attitude, well, here I am with my life, and then there's politics. And they're all corrupt, I don't like them, and ugh. Yeah. yeah. And I think you have that a lot. You also have that a lot in East Germany. And still with the young people, which really worries me. That, that I think is really worrisome, that that has, has not changed over the years. But this disaffected attitude, those up there and we here, we the normal people, that is wrong. Because even if you say, Ugh, I don't like politics. Politics will affect you. Like they will affect everybody. They affect everybody alike. Mm. And saying, oh, I don't care about politics, just says one thing. I am not standing up for my own interests. I am not involved. And when something goes wrong, ha, fine. I can blame somebody else. So that is something I would tell every young person and actually every citizen. I do not accept this. I'm not interested in politics. They affect you. And yes, you are interested. I mean, of course, people speak up against something which they don't like. 
Yeah, that's politics. And uh, also about, because you spoke about the European Parliament and Eurosceptic parties, um, I think they are lying to their public. Uh, I think there's a big difference between sovereignty, national sovereignty as they define it, and autonomy. Autonomy is the capacity of shaping your life and your future within the limits of where you live in. Nobody is an island. Yeah. You always have neighbors, Separate you always planet. have a history, you always have a connections with the rest mm -hmm. of the world. Autonomy means that in all these connections you can decide the direction to take. This talk about, oh, we need a national sovereignty back and it has all gone to Brussels. Um, that, in my opinion, is really misleading the voters because it conjures up an image of something which is not. We are all small countries in a big world. And I think the European Union is our best bet to be autonomous. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, the former Danish foreign minister said that to the British delegation when they, uh, during the Brexit negotiations, he said there's two different kinds of European countries. There's the small ones and those who haven't yet realized that they are small. And I think this just hits it on the head. Together, the European Union, that's nearly 400 million people, educated people, deep cultural roots, a common vision mm -hmm. of humanity, and how we, with differences, but a general agreement on how we want to live together in a democratic system. Uh, and then there's many other places in the world who do not share that do not share our cultural roots, who have different interests, many of them autocratically governed. And what does actually a country where there's 1.8 million people living or 12 million people living or name it. Uh, sorry, I just, I, or 86 million, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I beg you to consider the numbers and consider the framework which gives you the best chance of to live your way of life and not be dominated by somebody else. And that best chance is the European Union. So, oh. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> sorry, uh, but this is my real deep conviction. We were discussing the dismantling, the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. But, uh, you know, however, on August 16th, just in uh, almost a few weeks, two days more, uh, we'll, uh, you know, this is the date which marks another anniversary, significant in European history, the construction of the B Berlin Wall. Yeah. So you were uh, lucky, I would say, to be born, to have been born on the bright side, so to say, on the free side, of the, you know, the, in the yes. West Germany at that time. Yes. Uh, what did you know? What did you learn about the so-called Eastern Bloc? Because the Providence somehow brought you the former. Uh, Warsaw, Warsaw Pact country, uh, you know, Bulgaria yes. used to be in that, you know, in the social camp, so to say, yeah. socialistic camp. So what did you know about our world at that time? Well, when I was born, I was born in 61, uh, the year the wall was built. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think it was Contemporary built... Contemporary of the wall. Yeah, I am. And uh, I think it was built on the 13th because we always used to joke in my family, my sister's birthday is the 13th of August, some years later. So we always said, well, that has a lot, of, um, a, a lot to do with our family anniversaries. Anyway, uh, well, at first, nothing. Uh, what I did know growing up, that is that we lived in the Cold War. Uh, I mean, on each side, the threat of an atomic war was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in West Germany, we had the peace movement. When I was a young person, uh, that was very important to me. And the idea of getting into a dialogue with each other, not to let things spiral out of control. Um, when, and when the wall came down, I actually was in diplomat school. Uh, I, I had been sent by my ministry, because my French was so bad, to a French language school. Uh, which was in Belgium, in the Ardennes Mountains. And uh, so we were sitting there, uh, um, and uh, a bunch of us, and uh, learning, learning French grammar. 
uh, when it came up in the news that uh, the wall had come down. So what we did was we piled, two of us had cars, we piled in their cars and we drove in the night from Belgium, from Spa to Berlin. And uh, we spent three days there in on Berlin. the street. In, in Berlin, there oh, was, was no yeah, East yeah, Berlin no wall, anymore. No wall, yeah, yeah. That was the big thing. All of a the sudden, felt, yeah. all of a sudden, there were breakthroughs in the wall. You could just walk over the stones into, wow, East Can Berlin. Can you say that the clever journalistic question actually, you know, took the wall off? I remember the whole story. And all that. Yes, yes. Uh, when Chabowski said, "You are, as far as I know, when it was right happen. away." Yeah, he yeah, said, yeah, 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 "Right yeah, yeah. now, immediately." Yes, yes, yes. Active yes. immediately. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for your colleague. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, see, we speak yeah. about the threat of that time. Did I interrupt you? No, you okay. didn't. We speak about you know the the that time you know the mm, Iron Curtain, the Cold mm -hmm. War, etc. But these days, we have a clear, in my opinion, clear uh, risk uh, coming again from that part of the world, which was, you know, the leading uh, area of the socialistic camp at that time, the former Soviet Union, nowadays Russia and its war against Ukraine. Uh, what do you think? Why is it so that uh, many Europeans, even in Bulgaria, not even, including in Bulgaria, we have a kind of like difficulty to recognize this uh, threat posed to the civilized, to the free world, I'm avoiding this, you know, border uh, terms, to the free world by the nowadays uh, Putin's Russia. Why is it so, in your opinion? <laughs> That's another three million dollar question, I think. Three million? Uh, or or uh, Nobel Nami. Prize Peace question. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, let's, let's right now set the conditions for this Nobel Peace Prize and that actually by doing that I will also try to answer your questions uh, question and uh, I think when uh, between 2002 and 2006 my ministry sent me to Afghanistan uh, to work and my specific task was uh, help with the reconstruction of Afghan civic institutions in this case the Afghan police <clears throat> and um, if we have time or if we do another interview, uh, I About can, Afghanistan, yes. uh, I would like to talk with you. Afghanistan is, we'll is interesting. It, 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 has, it has really, uh, it is pertinent to your question. Mm -hmm. Why did we react so, so late? Because I asked my ministry to be transferred in 2006. Because <clears throat> my personal opinion was that we had ruined it. That we had messed up in and with Afghanistan. Many things had already gone wrong. And actually, in hindsight, I'm surprised that it lasted that long and only broke down in, uh, in the summer three years ago. Um, but I think the really wrong turn had been taken way before. Mm -hmm. But I can explain in another context. Uh, and as far as Russia is concerned, I think uh, Many people should have woken up when Putin gave a speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2007. Because he basically said it all. He wasn't lying. Yeah. He said it all, yes, precisely. He said it all. And I remember the reactions in the world of politics. Some were laughing, some were, you know, like... Well, it, it was basically, okay, I understand uh, its resentment from the past and... It, he was not being taken seriously mm -hmm. because nobody really could wrap their heads around it. And then in 2014, An action of I was working at, the, there was Georgia. Mm -hmm. There uh, Georgia, was Georgia yeah, already. Georgia more, yeah. <clears throat> and the, uh, 2014, I was already at NATO. And I was working in the domain of NATO-Russia relations. We had the NATO-Russia Council. There uh, was a, const a permanent Russian representative as far as yes, I remember. Yes, yes. Uh, there was a permanent Russian mission mm -hmm. and uh, there was a whole substructure at NATO with 17, I think 17 committees looking at different areas of possible cooperation and, and, and some of them, them went well. And then came Crimea 
annexation of Crimea. Uh, and uh, from that personally, I never looked back. Uh, but many, <clears throat> many tried to re-establish normal relations. Uh, for me personally, it was clear that uh, this would not stop. He would not stop there and probably uh, uh, try to go on. Uh, but anyway, for me, this was the point where any idea that the NATO Russia Council could achieve something was dead. Mm. Um, and I was, but but then, um, I mean, Russia del continued to deliver cheap energy. Let's face it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Germany is often blamed for that. You know, yes. better than me. Yes. And I think we should accept that blame. Many people, many of our political friends, many of our allies uh, spoke out against, for example, the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, but there was a deafness which was deafening. <laughs> oh, sorry, the metaphor isn't, isn't quite right. So why do I say that and why did I look back to Afghanistan? Uh, because I don't think that this is unique for German politics or for European politics or for American politics. Uh, I think we need to find out, and here we come to our Nobel Peace Prize, <laughs> yes. uh, why sometimes we do not draw conclusions from what we see. But we so much wish that something was not that way, mm -hmm. that we continue to pretend. Wishful thinking. Uh, there is a lot of wishful thinking. Uh, and there's a lot of not wanting to change. There's a lot of economic interests. There's a lot of innovation that would have to happen. Uh, and I think there's a problem in human nature and in the nature of politics in general, uh, which we really need to look at. For example, I mean, my eldest son was born in July 92. And at that day, the Spiegel, the German uh, weekly Magazine. Spiegel had its first big title on uh, the war in Yugoslavia on Sarajevo and the headline was war in Europe and that was shocking wasn't it um, but as far as I myself am concerned I kind of classed the, this war being over in 98 and I never looked to that region of Europe again. Okay, my professional Duties. career took me to Morocco, to the United States. I mean, but <clears throat> ever since I'm here, because you said in my first one and a half years, and now I'm here, um, now I'm really starting to understand that war. But in all that time in between, wars. yes, mm -hmm. I, was, I was not interested. And I'm really asking myself, how could that happen? So there's also a lot of self-criticism here. And I am really think we should seriously, honestly, try to find out how we can improve that mm. in the realm of politics, uh, in all the big organizations, in the EU, in NATO, in the OECE. Uh, to have some kind of an, an, a culture of errors, a culture of reacting to errors. And I think we need to have that. And the person who brings us to react more in real time and not 10 years too late, that person really should get a Nobel Prize and a Nobel Peace Prize. Hmm. Yeah, that's, you know, your memories about the uh, Yugo War, so-called, <laughs> stresses once again the point how important it is and I'm you know happy that Bulgaria co-sponsored the resolution of United Nations about the Sarajevo, yeah. uh, not Sarajevo, uh, Srebrenica, Srebrenica. Uh, yes, genocide. Yes. So uh, why did Germany keep the Soviet monuments? As far as I know there are oh. over 1000 monuments yeah. of the Soviet uh, army, Soviet soldiers who mm. died during the Second World War, yeah. fighting the Nazi Germany at that time, of course. 
but not only Soviet soldiers uh, left their lives there. But uh, most of these monuments, of course, are in the communist, uh, former communist Germany. Uh, but yet, you know, some of them are in the West, so to say. Uh, this part of Germany, which was under U.S. and British control, including uh, Soviet tank uh, monument, yeah, which is not Linden. far away yeah, from yeah. the Brandenburg. You, you saw that when you were in yeah, Berlin yeah, now. Of course, yeah. so why did Germany keep why these monuments? Keep we have this discussion here in Bulgaria. Should we... I can give you the easy answer. Okay. Uh, because we are legally obliged to do so. Reunification. Legally, yes. Yeah, no, we really entered a legal... As, as Austria, for example, you know, they are neutral because... But that would be an easy answer and laws can be changed. Um, and, of course, there is discussions about namings of streets, about monuments, mm -hmm. about all things that refer to a past when something was seen differently and now we see it differently and should that street still keep that name? Should that monument still be standing there? And of course, uh, I've, I've watched with great interest the discussion here in Sofia on monuments. And I've also been to the Museum of Socialist History. And I've, here in Sofia? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and I've, it's uh, walking Socialist distance Art. here from the Embassy, Socialist Arts. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And I've never seen so many heads of Lenin in one place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I think there's many different ways to deal with that. Uh, me Personally, um, I think it is only the second best solution to take a monument down. Mm -hmm. I think there's much more creative ways to deal with that. Uh, there's one monument in Germany, I would have to look up the exact city where it is, uh, that is a World War I person which is now highly contested also. There's a racist uh, uh, angle to it. And so, and, but the statue of this gentleman on his horse, um, uh, there was a discussion, should we take it down? Uh, and instead it was decided to tilt it five degrees. <laughs> so everybody who sees that now is, what's wrong here? Yeah. And has will, will just fall? to wrap their head around who was that person? Why has it been tilted? What's the state of the discussion mm -hmm. now? Another example which I personally like, uh, also one of these war hero movements, a uh, very famous uh, sculptor was asked to do another monument, which is now standing facing the other monument, a monument to the victims of that, mm -hmm, that person. person. And now they face each other, and they're both there. It's part of history. You don't change history in retrospect. So bottom line is uh, public bottom debate, line is, probably. Social public um, debate. You know, uh, together with the Mongolian ambassador and together with UNICEF, uh, on the 1st of June, which is the, holiday, the, the day of the children here in Bulgaria, mm -hmm. beautiful holiday, and the state agency for the protection of childhood, the Bulgarian state agency, uh, we, did a, we did a party uh, up at the Campani Day which yes. you could argue is a socialist monument, but it is also a beautiful space. It is dedicated to children. And there was a United Nations General Children's Assembly here in mm -hmm. Bulgaria, mm -hmm. and I think that is something Bulgaria can be proud of. Um, anyway, it is a beautiful space. It is dedicated to children and would it a super party. Uh, and I think everybody loved it. Uh, and you can also reclaim a monument for your time. Hmm. You spoke about uh, Putin's uh, speech in Munich uh, 2007. Yeah. That's one point around, you know, many people argue the role of Germany in uh, Russian energy supply to Europe. That's another yeah. point of discussions, debates. But in Bulgaria, we often argue about uh, Germany's support for one of the leading parties in our country for probably two decades, the party of the former prime minister uh, and his uh, party, GERB. Do you think in that regard uh, some mistakes were made by the mm, past, uh, in the past uh, precisely because of this uh, support for a person who is, a, you know, okay, he is well known in Bulgarian politics. Do you think it's, uh, it was a kind of mistake, this support for over tw almost 20 years? 
Well, that is a bit of a very broad question, isn't it? Uh, okay. Uh, it is very well yeah, known. Yeah. It is very well known uh, that Chancellor Merkel uh, and Prime Minister Borisov enjoyed a good working relationship, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, I think the seen from a German point of view, uh, Mr. Borisov, who was whose party is in the same party family in the European Parliament, uh, was always uh, very faithful or uh, reli reliable, is the reliable, word I was looking yes. for, a partner for Germany's position in the European Union. Um, and I think that obviously was probably facilitated by the fact that both leaders were in the same family of political parties in Europe. Um, now, if I try to dig deeper into your question, um, because you said 20 years, not 16 years. Almost. I'm yeah, not yeah. good in numbers, but um, let's You put may it be referring uh, to the activity of politi German political foundations. Okay, that broadens the questions. The question. um, anyway, I think that is basically a good thing. The Konrad Adenauer Foundation obviously always has partnered GERB, uh, but we have. Uh, several political foundations and they have partnered other political parties here. Not always has that been a smooth relationship. Some have broken. Uh, uh, there has been a lot of soul searching and nail biting uh, and things like that. <clears throat> but uh, I think uh, it is a it is a pretty transparent support. Everybody knows about it. And it's not only in Bulgaria. This is, if you so want, one of the German export articles, the activities of political foundations. And uh, uh, in <clears throat> one of my last turns where I was doing something completely different, which had to do with human rights and economic relationships and things, uh, I spent a couple of some days in Mexico. Uh, and talk to three of our political foundations who are active there. And their mission is promotion of democracy. We talked about coalition agreements earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, that is something, uh, general political techniques, not really party bound, but possibilities to deal with difficult questions also in new democracies. Yeah. That is something that is their mission, uh, and mostly they are headed by German politicians who have moved from active political life to this kind of activity. And I think basically it's not a bad thing, and it does not mean an influence in the concrete political action. So, and I mean, there is, as we said, nobody is an island, yeah? Uh, and no country is an island, and there's always influences from outside. Uh, globally active business exerts influence on the national politics. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want me to quote examples, I mean, they spring to mind. Um, Everybody knows uh, there. We, we all, every country always has, of course, also influences, economical ties, political ties, other ties. Um, there's uh, the diaspora. I mean, there's nearly half a million Bulgarian citizens living in Germany, living and working in Germany, to the great, great profit of German society. These are IT engineers, these mm -hmm. are people working in the health sector, doctors, etc. And I hope the benefit is mutual, mutual in some way. It is a super thing. I love it. Um, but of course, that also is an influence that is active between two countries. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, they vote. So you don't, they vote. Bulgarian diaspora so you don't get rid of that. Bulgarian elections. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is a, an ideal and a wrong ideal to think mm. that no such influence should ever exist. Yeah, I see. Okay, well, we, we, we are going to the end of our conversation and thank you for the patience, by the way. Uh, general question, 
in Bulgaria at least is the corruption, the fight with the political corruption, so to say. And I myself, I often give an, exa an example of uh, German politicians who resign after even slightest, you know, sus uh, suspicion about their financial deeds, so to say, mm. uh, or relationship with their sponsors, etc. I give the example of uh, the former president, uh, Mr. Wolf. Mm. Uh, from your perspective, how important it is, you know, the corruption fight in Bulgaria for the bilateral relationship between Bulgaria and Germany, especially? Well, I think it is, first of all, it is important for Bulgaria itself. Mm -hmm because there's nothing that undermines trust in, in, in political actions so much as corruption. Uh, I also think actually that the tendency to do corrupt things is universally human. And uh, the way you deal with it is in having a good system to deal with that. To have good controls, to have good checks, to have good balances, to have good journalism and to have independent courts. Uh, and I think if I was a Bulgarian citizen, I would be very happy that the uh, European general attorney, Ms. Laura Kovici, mm -hmm. for example, uh, she has already been to Bulgaria mm -hmm. and she speaks highly of her cooperation with Bulgarian authorities. Of course, I mean, they do not cover everything. They cover things that have a connection with European money being spent. Um, but I think things like these are important, structures are important. So if Bulgaria wants to do something about that problem, Bulgaria will probably not succeed in changing human nature. Nobody has until now succeeded in doing that. Um, but give yourself good institutions, give yourself effective control mechanisms. Um, and uh, raise public awareness about it. Because um, also, I mean, it has often been named, corruption has often been named a uh, uh, cavalier's little crime. Now, how do I translate that in, in English? Um, it, is, it was not so serious. It was kind of a white collar crime, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, Minor. Uh, not yeah, a big issue, no. morally not yeah, really yeah. a big issue. Everybody, everybody does would, it. everybody does it. No, no, no. I mean, imagine yourself talking to your children. What you try to teach them, and then you do something which is not that bad. Come back home, and look into the face of your children. Is that going to work? I don't think so. Yeah. yeah? So. Uh, I think we need to abolish the notion of white collar crime and abolish the notion that it, it ain't that bad. Um, because it actually kills people. I mean, look at cases where buildings have collapsed mm -hmm. because some white collar criminals economized a little bit on the concrete uh, and bribed some uh, city official who was overseeing the construction to look in another direction. Um, Look at uh, what Ms. Kervergy actually, uh, um, she said that her mind about this changed when there was a, a fire, I think it was, uh, in a discotheque, which already had taken place because nobody had enforced rules on, on, on those kind of places. There was no fire safety because somebody had arranged himself with some official. Uh, and then the people who were hurt in that fire, severely hurt partly, were carried off to public hospitals, where, to a public hospital where it turned out that this hospital did not have the equipment it professed it had because that equipment had been turned to some private facility. So people died. Yes, people die of white color crimes. Uh, and I think so that is maybe worth a public discussion. Thus, it is not that bad. No, it is very bad and it is shameful. And kills people. And it kills people. Last question. This year we will mark uh, 145 years of uh, diplomatic relationship, relationship between Bulgaria yes. and Germany. What event uh, that far uh, you think is the most symbolic for this long period, maybe except for Einzug Zweizug? 
dran. Eins zu zwei zu dran. Except that. All that what else is, you know, the symbolic event for this period. Oh my God, what is the most symbolic event? Now you have me, actually. Um, I would not be able to think of one single event. There have been so many important events in our long bilateral relationship. And I think uh, what I take from that, of course, we, we need to celebrate it in a way. Uh, but I would prefer to celebrate 150 years, you know, with yeah. really fireworks and everything. 145 is... Hmm. Somewhere um, in between, yeah. Yeah. Um, I would celebrate the uh, uh, science cooperation, which is... Science cooperation. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's such a deep network... Uh, of research and science cooperation between our countries that goes back a hundred years and not many people know about it. There are relations between universities, Bulgarian and German, that have gone on for more than a hundred years and also more recent. Uh, there's um, high technology that's being developed together. Uh, we are now looking into possibilities to cooperate on space technology and uh, on climate research in the Antarctic and things like that. Uh, there are so many things between our countries which are little known and not celebrated enough. So I'm, I'm not sure if I would celebrate one, one singular thing. I would celebrate the long, long friendship. Thank you for that interview. Uh, at least two things, you know, thrilled me to search you further for a conversation. Yes. Afghanistan, Middle East, that's yes. very, for me, it's very professionally, very interesting yeah. topic and area. And of course, maybe in uh, five years. The hundred, let's say in four years, because four we years, already yeah. start preparing we could, you know, for the we big. We could discuss, yeah, we could discuss this uh, I would love 50 to. anniversary. I would love to. Thank you very much. Uh, also, In the meantime, I hope you yeah. will be our guest on the 3rd of October. Uh, I'll do my best. Or will you, you be covering the, the electoral campaign? <laughs> well, I mean... Uh, I'm just kidding. See, I one, one friend, of, friend of mine, yes. I would call it, a uh, journalist, um, he said these days uh, that uh, regarding some particular event in Bulgaria, you know, this uh, you know, the effort to create government, he said, I was avoiding to read my article one year ago because I was afraid that I will just, you know, copy-paste it. <laughs> so the politics, I will cover the campaign probably, but, you know, I yeah. will definitely join the uh, celebration. Thank you for that. And it was great organized, you know, greatly organized, the whole European uh, Championship tournament, very nicely organized. I was there in Berlin, uh, public area, you know, fan I'm area. I'm glad you liked it. Good. I'm glad and you I'm liked it. And I'm sorry I can't congratulate you for a bigger success, but we put it on the referee. But we actually, put all on the referee. No, but I think it was a success. And, uh, um, well, yeah, me, from me personally, I don't understand much about uh, football. But my father, mm -hmm. when he was young, was uh, a reserve player in quite a renowned German club. He's an opera singer, but he played football. Mm -hmm. Which club? <laughs> Offenbacher Kickers. It is the club of Jimmy Hartwig and uh, uh, Erwin Kostede. Uh, who played in the Wimbledon uh, uh, mm -hmm. match mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who in 1972 was uh, top of the German championship, was German champion. So, uh, and my brother-in-law mm -hmm. um, is a member of uh, uh, Werder Bremen and also works as a lawyer for Werder Bremen. So my family is very much involved in that soccer. That should be Werder Bremen. Werder Bremen. Yeah. The, there's a, I'm a fan have, of HSV and Bayern München. Well, maybe you would consider to also, <laughs> to no, maybe not shift, but Werder Bremen, okay. my brother-in-law tells mm -hmm. me, has now uh, uh, struck a contract with a young Bulgarian talent mm -hmm. uh, for a keeper. I see, goalkeeper, yeah. Goalkeeper, yes. So we will be watching him very... Okay, okay. I'll yes, and Ivan Groev, he played for Werder Bremen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you see my family feeds me with uh, football, football news. Uh, and I think the big thing with the championship was that there's a German national team again 
which is worth cheering for. Yeah. Your Excellency, thank you very much for this thank interview. You. Thank you. Thank you.